Upper Echelon is brought to you by Deloitte for innovative thinking and thorough strategic planning. Turn to Deloitte. A veteran of South African business and uh, philanthropy and many other things as well, as you, uh, no doubt we'll find out in the course of the next 10 minutes or so. Bertie Lubner is in our Upper Echelon this week. And you've got a birthday coming up, Bertie. Yes, next week, 81. I would have been 83, but I was sick when I was young. So I'm sticking to 81. The budget, just on a serious note to start with. Yes. Uh, I, I had some uh, quite interesting feedback with a column I wrote this week saying, hang on, it's about time we had activists getting into the budget. It's about time that we started really looking at the poor. Um, the critics were saying that you don't really know what you're talking about. I'd love to get your view on on last week's budget and, and how you see this move perhaps to a, a more caring capitalism? Well, it was without doubt I would put term it as an aggressive budget. Uh, I don't think we've had such a far-reaching one in one hit, particularly with the development program that they're talking about. But what worries me, and I think it's uh, confirmed in your article, you know, we've had it in business and we've had it in South Africa so many years. Strategies, good thinking, but never properly executed because two things. We haven't got the skills. And number two, most important, government departments don't work together. Uh, this whole program of 300 billion has to be covered by various departments. The, the, the hold-ups are impossible. I mean, this happened already with the program that we in the manufacturing circle worked out with uh, DTI on local procurement. It's an absolute obvious, it's a natural. But you can't believe the impediments because the incoherentness between government departments, and this is what worries me. So, yes, the thinking's right. The way he's going to raise the money and not put the country into bigger debt. All of that is good because there is cash around, and I think we can fund it. But it'll only be funded when people who part with their cash are satisfied that there's going to be delivery. And that's confidence in the economy. And I think the budget was a bit of a confidence booster. Uh, I'm pleased with the um, way we're not in debt like the rest of the world. I have an abhorrence for debt. Uh, so, um, you know, when you've got uh, debt under your control and you've got re uh, revenue uh, coming in reasonably assured, then, you know, it, it was a good budget. Uh, this coherence that you talk about is something that uh, Pravin Gordon himself uh, related to. 68% of the capital spending that should have been spent last year was spent, so that means 32% wasn't. But where does... Come on, Bertie, you've, you've, you know these politicians well. You've engaged, you engage with great fondness with uh, people like Nelson Mandela, Trevor Emanuel. I've seen your in interactions there. How does the coordination happen? Who, who becomes the glue? Or how, does, how do we overcome this problem that we well, tell you? Well, it's have? like in any situation in business. If there isn't interdepartmental uh, liaison, you can be a manufacturer. That's the sales staff will sell huge amounts. But if the factory can't deliver, or vice versa, if the factory is delivering, but the sales staff aren't uh, promoting the products. Uh, it has to come from leadership. And it's only leadership that enforces it from the top right the way down. And there has to be a different culture in the country. Not of protection, of protecting our past, but rather delivering our future. And when you sit down around the table, and as you know, I've been an activist for years, indicating that this country will never get going as it should do and we're losing our preeminent position in Africa if it isn't a combination of public-private sector, government, uh, obviously the unions, labor's got to be involved and there's got to be a lot of changed attitudes. But the biggest attitude change has to be how do we get together and do things? And you sit around the table as equals. It's not government on the one hand and private sector. It's South African concerned citizens who've got experience in trying to overcome the particular obstacles, whether it is the um, 
development program or education, bring the best skills you've got together, all the resources you've got together, because with each one of these issues, poverty, education, uh, employment, you know, we're at war with these things, and wars have to be won. They can't, you can't afford to lose it, and if you've got that attitude of saying it doesn't matter who I am and who uh, we represent, it's what can we do together to make things happen. Uh, that kind of po almost uh, personality or the force of personality. I've just finished Steve Jobs' biography. Have you read it yet? No, it's, I haven't. It's, it's interesting in there in that he, he the contrast, or the, the writer, um, Walter Isaacson, brilliant book, contrasts how Jobs managed to do things by his force of personality. There's no silos within Apple. Everyone works in one direction. Absolutely. So here you had a company that was pretty much bust 15 years ago, now is the most valuable in the world. I suppose those lessons that one learns in business can be applied on a wider stage. It, from, from your own perspective, I mean, you grew up in learning about business. You were in a, in a business, uh, family business, I guess, pretty much from the, the day that you opened your eyes. Oh, yes. The first words I uttered was not Mama and Papa, was PG. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my father's passion. And PG today, it's a private company. Many yes. people forget it was listed in the stock market, delisted in 1990. How is PG in the world today? Where is it? Well... In uh, the South African economy, I mean, we, are, we have a fantastic brand. We are well spread over the country. We deliver. Uh, we are fighting two battles. And I'm glad to have an opportunity to make a statement that the country's manufacturing sector is going to be eliminated in the next few years unless there's a radical change in government thinking. We are being annihilated, and I'm not being uh, emotional about it. Yes, I am emotional about it. The amount of Chinese products that are coming in, state-sponsored, where there is no chance that a private sector company can possibly compete with products that are made under our cost and under national norms of competitive. So we can be competitive with Europe, USA, etc. But you can't be competitive with state-run businesses that get the most unbelievable aid to be able to come. They are determined to capture this market, and our manufacturing sector over time will be either eliminated or virtually um, in the hands of our Chinese friends. And they can be friends, but we've allowed them to become enemies because of the way things are handled. And I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, what sort of arrangements President Zuma has made with the Chinese. But it's quite clear that we can, when it comes to looking at uh, well-deserved protection from other countries in the world, there isn't a problem. But as soon as it comes to China, it's like a wall of silence comes in. The same attitude that took place with the Dalai Lama. There wasn't a logical reason it was a Chinese domination. And we are told it's, we've got to run as uh, the market forces. Yeah, of course we've got to run with market forces. But it's got to be with equal situations. Their currency is so weak relative to the currencies of the world. So, yes, it's a wonderful thing that China's coming up. But I'm telling you that it is going to be a most... Uh, critical element of future policy, even in the procurement side. You know, yes, buy local, but if you're not in a situation to be competitive, and buy local doesn't mean irrespective of price, of course. We've got to be competitive quality, uh, service, etc. But pricing against the rest of the world, yes, we are basically competitive in our core industries. But the rest is just a very, very sad situation. So what we've got is not a creation of jobs, a loss of jobs. And the pro this new uh, program of, uh, of uh, governments, you know what? Those are short-term jobs. And I agree, I'm, for, I'm delighted because at least they're going to employ a lot of unskilled people in this as well as a certain amount of skilled 
but they're not what happens when the program comes to an end. Manufacturing companies are forever, as long as they are globally competitive, as long as they are efficient, the right products, niche products, etc. So I'm not asking for looking after us without proper, proper evaluation of our integrity and of our competitiveness. That's interesting because the feedback I'm getting, particularly from Rob Davies and the uh, Department of Trade and Industry, is that manufacturing is our priority in this country, that uh, the 85 million jobs that have to be relocated from China and that hopefully some of them would come to South Africa and, and, and. But what you're telling me is perhaps what the politicians are saying and what's being executed again in the same way as with infrastructure is not quite the same. Well, I'd like to be discreet. I'm sitting on the public-private partnership with Rob Davies and a wonderful man he is and Ibrahim Patel. We sit down, we agree, we discuss and in overall terms I really truly believe in their heart of hearts they're with us but there's a stumbling block ahead of them. And I'm aware of the difficulties that they've got in trying to bring about a more uh, acceptable policy for the manufacturing industry. So at this point in time, China is uh, swaying, perhaps, opinion. Absolutely. Take, take China out of the equation. Uh, because there are these dumping, it's helped by different countries, you can do something about it, if you prove it. We've proven to government, we've actually proven to them in rands and cents that it's not possible for them to be making these products, never mind getting a return, covering their costs. And we say, put in countervailing duties, put in some suspensive duties, and then go and investigate, but don't wait until companies are out. I mean, we had a meeting the other day of about 40 companies uh, we've got to limit the number because we don't want to be another, just an, another association. So we're a group of manufacturers at uh, different sizes, etc. And I tell you, it was the most gloomiest meeting I've been to. There's an absolute fact that our RAND is going to strengthen. It has to. With the amount of money that's going to come in while Europe and, and, and uh, America are with the lowest interest rates, I think, probably in history. So where are people who want to invest and get a return, pension funds, etc., they're going to come to countries that are giving a yield and a degree of stability, like Australia. Their manufacturing industry is also going to hell. But they've got protection in a number of areas, as has Brazil, by the way. They have put in protective duties because WTO rules don't apply anymore. Nobody sticks to them. So when it comes to uh, uh, South Africa, we're going to be hit with, a, uh, it is my forecast that by, by May, June, the RAND will be in the 670 level, somewhere around there. So that makes us uncompetitive again, particularly against the Chinese currency. F imports will flood into this country companies will close, jobs will be lost, so we'll be an importing country. Where do we earn our foreign exchange? Our deficit will just keep rising. Mm. These, are, these are complex and difficult issues, but generally speaking, it's, it's sad to see the Afro-optimist, the man who always has a smile on his face, feeling so, so uh, well, concerned about the future of this country. Why is it that you're not making the, uh, the headway that you can in the people who can address these issues? Well, Let's say this, that I, together with others, and certainly I don't lead the campaign, I'm part of it. We are going to do whatever we can. We have no option. We're going to use whatever pressure we can, whatever um, uh, logic, illogic, emotion, whatever. Because this is not something that, I mean, we as a business will survive because we've got strong shareholders, but it means we keep putting money in and we're keeping money in and you're waiting. So you wait for the world to come right and it will come right. But when you go through this period of time, we've just got no option but to support it. We've got people who've worked for us for donkey's years. So it's not a shareholder issue, it's a people issue. 
And that's when you talk about philosophy. Our lives are governed by people around us. You can't just say, well, what's good for me? It's what's good for us, all of us. I can't stand, I can tell you, and I am emotional, I can't stand putting people off because I know that they, the type of people I'm having to put off aren't going to get another job opportunity. I try and put myself in their position. So you try and manipulate, do whatever you can, keep things with small losses as long as you can. So yes, we will use every method that's available to us to get some form of sanity regarding government. You asked about the budget. We were really hoping that there would be some mention of government's attitude to help alien industries. You know, when, when an industry is in difficulties, as so many are, and I mentioned the 40 me people that were at the meeting the other evening, 20% of them indicated clearly by the end of this year if things don't change uh, in terms of either currency or protection from this type of dumping, they're closing their businesses. Now that's over and above what we have had the year before and the year before. So it's not a new phenomena. So we've, um, we've just got to find solutions and the methodology, but uh, coming back to the budget, we were hoping that they would allocate low interest money through the IDC to identify companies that deserve to be in business but are failing not through any things that they're doing wrong, but circumstances beyond control. Give them at least low interest money. Give them export incentives. This, this is the story that's happened around the world already. So it's not innovative by us. It's fact. This is, the motor industry in America would have been annihilated. Look how well they're doing because they were given assistance. We just can't get it, and we'd hoped it would come through in the budget, so it didn't. Sorry uh, that I'm talking so much about our sector, but I'm very concerned, not about our business. Our business will survive, not because of huge profit or any normal profitability, but because the shareholders are standing by. Bertie Labner in Upper Echelon this week, and Upper Echelon was brought to you by Deloitte for innovative thinking and thorough strategic planning. Turn to Deloitte.